So I am in a snow skills class of sorts today. Just a buddy out here showing us what to do and what not to do, kind of teaching us some of the dynamics of the PCT and the trail and what we can expect ahead. So you will see lots of his lessons today. This is my first time ever snowshoeing. So already a first. Yay. Caused by uh, the snowstorms themselves. One of my pet peeves is that hikers, especially summer hikers, are always looking down. Looking down, avoiding the rocks, avoiding tripping. Makes sense. And it's normal. But when you're on snow, especially during the secret season, especially during May, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot to trip over. It's a smooth ramp. Not until a lot of footprints get out there and things you could trip on. Things called what we call chicken heads. People go like, okay, Ned, what the hell are you talking about? Chicken heads. Chicken heads in the snow. But you see like these little, these little snowballs here. Or, or even places where people have, have stepped and there's high points in the snow. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like a chicken head sitting up there. And it's frozen to the snowpack. So you catch a, a ski edge, and you catch a, a snowshoe edge, the edge of your foot, you can tow into it and trip. Watch out for chicken heads. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, the snow in May is smooth. There's not a reason to be looking down. So be looking up and figure out, like if I was going to be going to Elephant's Back, what would be my, my route to, to take? Because see, there's no trail. So when there's no trail, it's total freedom. You can go wherever the hell you want. There's a big lake up in there, big bowl back in there. Lakes have outflow creeks. Following a creek up is more like a ramp, right? Why go over a washboard when I can take the easy route? So where's the creek? Well, the creek looks like it kind of comes down way over there. So if I'm standing here and I want to go to Elephant's Back, I would, might go down here to, to the meadow, follow the creek up to get to the lake where I want to spend the night. These are the things that should be going through your head all the time when it comes to route selection um, on snow. If I did go this way, what would be my objective? The ridge. I want to attain a ridge and follow a ridge. Down there, I want to attain the creek, follow the creek. Going from meadow to meadow is basically following the creek. You know, there's the Pacific Crest Trail on the map. Let's go south down toward uh, Squaw Valley Ski Area. If they don't know how to read a topo map and they're not paying attention to the t context, the written words, they're not gonna notice that immediately from highway, old Highway 40, it goes right up onto the ridge around Sugar Bowl Ski Area up Mount Lincoln and Mount Judah in that way. <clears throat> and then from Sugar Bowl, top Sugar Bowl, on back towards Squaw, it's entirely along a very exposed ridge. And if there's any kind of um, thermal heating in the San Joaquin Valley, like down by Sacramento, creates a lot of wind over that ridge. So you just get buffeted. And if there's any weather coming in, saw lenticulars three days ago. Do I want to be on that ridge today? I don't think so. Back to the weather, since we're talking about exposure. If you saw lenticulars three days ago and you're northbound on the crest trail or something, and you think, okay, that meant something. What did it mean? It means there's a storm coming or going. Coast of California, low pressure system sitting out here. And you know the weather, which way does the weather go? It goes from the west toward the east, east. right? So we know that this low pressure system is going this way. Where are we? Lake Tahoe's right about here. So we're there. Three days ago, I'm going up on the Pacific Crest Trail. Three days ago, I saw lenticular clouds. This thing is turning, low pressure systems turn this way. High pressure systems go the other way. In between the two, see if I take this high pressure system, spin, it's going this way, right? Right. Whoops. Yeah. Summation of wind forces, you're gonna have a hell of a lot of wind where the two fronts meet each other. So as this guy comes in, as the low pressure system comes in, I'll see a series of signs. So uh, lenticulars are usually first. 
Then as this guy gets closer, you're gonna have probably a break in the weather. Beautiful day and everybody around you is gonna go like, what the hell were you talking about? We're gonna get bad weather, it's a beautiful day. The stars were out last night, what are you talking about? Give it a day. As it gets closer, then you're gonna start to see stratus clouds, which are kind of like this, but thicker. There's sort of an opaque gray, whitish front coming in. Then you'll have a front wall or a prefrontal ridge. And then it's gonna start getting into more vertical development and you get cumulus clouds. And then you get the black stuff, the dark stuff, and the nasty stuff. However, now, what if this low were up here? And what if this guy's going across north of you? How do you know if a storm is above you or below you? Wind direction. Right. So let's just use this as an example. If I'm standing here, the wind is going to be out of my southwest. It's coming from the southwest. If the storm is below me, if I'm standing up here, the wind's going to be out of my due south. This is, of course, barring the fact that you're in a canyon or you know, you've got other buildings or something that might change the direction of the wind. If I'm south of the storm, it's going above me, I'm down here, the wind is gonna be more out of the west. <clears throat> so if you, as you're hiking along, another takeaway expression is look up. If you're walking along and you're looking up and there's lenticulars, okay. Beautiful starry night, okay. Hmm, let's just think about that. Okay, maybe there's a storm, maybe it isn't. Pay attention to wind direction. Next time you're on a pass, which way is it coming from? On the pass, on the ridges, the best place is to assess wind direction because there's no obstacles. Um, okay, the next day you start seeing stratus, like gray stuff. Now I've deliberately omitted the first cloud sign. Sorry, the magnesium in that thing is driving me nuts. <laughs> Ah, but I just finished it. That's really good. I like this. Um, <laughs> so I want you to be thinking what actually is the first sign of a storm coming in. It's not the lenticulars. It's the wind, isn't it? No, not necessarily. The wind will be at the frontal boundary. Right. What's way out here to that low? What's way out here? Okay, fine. Let's do it. Way out here, maybe three, four days out, are cirrus clouds. Those are those high... Right. Wispy suckers, not like that necessarily, but what do we know right now? If you guys have been watching the weather, which you should always do before you leave on a trip, get a feel for that area before you get here. So, and then always check the weather report that morning, check the avalanche report that morning. You know, uh, what did we just have? We just had a two foot dump two days ago. Uh, avalanche, alpine meadows, fatality, all that sort of stuff. What happened was, is that the snow con water content of the snow was so wet and heavy that uh, it didn't stick to the... Here we go again, I'm gonna come right behind you. <laughs> I told you there was a lot to, to, to be aware of. See, this is all stuff to be aware of. Okay, this is your hillside. And you're standing on your hillside. I can't draw, mm -hmm. but that's you, <laughs> sort of. Got a hat on. Any slope, greater than 30 degrees. So here's your 30, here's your maybe 20, here's your 45. Anything above 30-ish. I can't remember the exact number. So for you guys that are, that are you know, <clears throat> statistically inclined, uh, excuse me, but above here, you get spontaneous avalanches. In here, there's a chance of it. Below here, low, very low chance. So where's the safest place to travel when you have conditions that are iffy? Here. Flat here. to here right. or up on the ridges, right. above the slope. So um, if we were here during the height of the storm or immediately after, another graphic, then one day out, two days out, three days out. What's happening? So here the storm is dumping. When the storm is dangerous, it's not just because it's windy and you can't see. It's when, especially when it comes to snow, because this is what we're talking about, it's nothing but snow. 
if it hasn't snowed in a while, what happens? The sun is out, it's beautiful, it's warming. What happens to the surface? It melts, refreezes, turns hard, smooth, not necessarily icy, it just gets what we like to call crusty, okay? But when new snow falls on it, like what happened at Alpine, you get a ton of new snow greater than a foot. So anything greater than a foot or more of snow on a surface that won't stick to it can slide. So here you are in the Sierra, hiking through in May. You get hit with a three foot storm, it can happen. This is, this is right here to right here. So this is day one. I know because you took an avalanche one class, which is what I'm spewing out to you guys, that the snowpack is highly unstable. Now, hopefully you've chosen a place to camp that's surrounded by trees and it's kind of flat and it's nowhere near some place that an avalanche could start up there and come down and take you out. Because mm -hmm. that happens. You may have thought, oh man, this is the best place to camp. We're gonna be safe. Starts up there and it nails you in the middle of the night. Stuff happens. So, this first day, don't move. So this day, the snowpack begins to consolidate. What does that mean? It settles, it hardens, it bonds mm -hmm. to the layer below it, or not. So this is when everything starts moving. When it's being dumped on, heavy snow or lots of it, uh, onto a, a, a steep enough slope where it's going to spontaneously release or say say you're smart and you're saying okay well I'm down here on this level I'm 20 degree mark I can I can go out walking this stuff across that hillside yes no maybe your own weight may be enough to break the bond between the layers like you see here just for example this could be a layer that line this, is an, this could be an ice layer. There could be another one down here. Now, this winter I found uh, we do have what's called a depth hoar layer. Depth hoar is like feathers. Think of short, like, like a, a smaller bird's feather. You know, they're only about yay long, maybe. Well, all these feathers are standing up in the snowpack because of the, type of the type of snow, the moisture content, and the temperature at which it fell, or thereafter. And you, hopefully, will be blessed when you go through the Sierra to see depth hoar literally, or surface, surface hoar, mm -hmm. literally rise up in fingers off the snow. And you'll see it in the morning. Really cool. And if you look around rocks and stuff in shady areas, you see these feathers of ice, right, uh, you know, growing vertically. But anyway, your own weight under the right conditions on a supposedly benign slope can cause it to release. If you're on that slope, immediately after a heavy snowstorm. So this window here, this is, this is storm, this is the first day, this is second day, cool your jets, take a day in your tent. And it's gonna be hard because you're geared to go, go, go. Well, try not to gear to go, go, go. It's like judge stuff, is it safe or not? Stay in your camp. Let us see. It's going to consolidate the snowpack, but you're going to stay in your camp seat. Let her see. Here's when you can get going again. Test the snow as best you can. Avalanche level level one classes teach you to dig snow pits and, and find out if the snow has bonded. Did this amount here bond to this? Actually, let's just see what we got here. Oh, see how soft that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. See how hard it is here? Uh, yeah. I can get my fingers in there, but not like here. Uh -huh. So if you're walking, you're walking down on the hard layer, not the top layer, right? Yeah, you're walking on the, on, if you're punching through the soft stuff, you're standing on the hard layer, and there's nothing wrong with that, but what I'm pointing out is hard this soft powder probably is not bonding to that. Right, right. Because that's an ice layer. It right. doesn't bond to that. So I, 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 see, I see this, or I feel this in the pack, and I get a dump of snow, yeah. I'm gonna think that's not gonna bond, I'm gonna stay in my camp, I'm gonna walk on ridges, I'm gonna walk in valleys, that kind of thing. Right, right. 
Now that'll be if you get a heavy storm in May. Right. So wait for the bond. Wait for it to bond and the sea. Consolidate, settle, freeze up. Make it so that you're walking now on the surface because it's now frozen. It has bonded already? Yes. Okay. Yes, because it's percolated down. When you see that freeze layer, well, it's not 100%. Because you can get a frozen layer uh, without consolidation, because it's it's like maybe it rained uh, lightly, or maybe it's foggy like up in Washington and it's just moist on the top and then it froze. So then you're going to have a surface crust or a surface um, what the heck we call that um, boilerplate. It's like a boilerplate. The surface is going to be nice and hard, and it's just like you're using the edges of your skis, or you're really gripping in with your shoes, or you really want to have uh, your crampons on, but you're punching through every once in a while into powder. That would be a surface boilerplate, like on top. Stratus, frontal bank, storm, cumulus, black, that kind of stuff. Wind direction will tell you whether it's south of you, north of you, or coming right at you, bearing, barring, um, topographic features okay so by looking up and paying attention to what's going on you'll know when to camp you know where to camp you know how to be safe overnight that kind of stuff depending upon if a foot or more of snow has dropped during an event do I sit and wait another day do I wait a day and then go out and test and see you're going to be going out to go to the bathroom anyway. You're going to find out whether you can start walking on the surface of the snow or you're still kicking your way through powder. So you got to make that call. Yes, you can walk through powder if it's flat, but if you got a, a foot or more of powder on something steep, think twice. See those tracks going straight up? I do. And I was talking a minute ago about how your own body weight can cause a, surf, a, a slab to release right. or an avalanche to release. So if you absolutely had to go somewhere what is the safest way to deal with a slope switch back so here once again from here to here is your hiking zone so from zero degrees up to about 30 this is iffy so 20 to 30 or whatever the actual numbers are that's too much that's slideable now for the layman since we don't have ways, yeah, we do. I didn't bring it with me. We have ways to measure the slope of the pitch, you know, how many degrees. If it looks to you like you love to glissade it, sit down on your butt and slide down. You wish you had your skis. You want to go slide, skiing down that slope. You don't want to be on it right. in the backcountry. Right. Okay. Safest way up is where you're not bisecting and causing a release. Okay, so say. Say this is the pitch of your hill, right? And I want to go across it. I want to get to the pass that's over there. I want to get to something over there. Do I simply traverse across? Because what you're doing is you're creating a fault line. And your simple body weight standing here could cause this whole thing to crack and slide. And that's how they happen. So you, so you either go down or you go up a ridge. Yes. And down. Straight up does not create a fault line. Right. Toe in, right. self belay. Right. So, self belay, say this is the hill. Self belay is where you take your axe and you run it all the way in to the surface of the snow. And you kick your way up to it and then you do it again. You don't pull with your, you don't pull with your upper body? Yes, right? you do. Okay. But you need to have three points of contact. That's your right. one. Right. And then two feet. two feet. So right. you kick your way up to it and you pull your weight. That's the belay. Belay right. um, is really anchoring yourself, but that's how you get up the hill. Right. It doesn't create a fault line. Right. So therefore, it's the safest in an, on an iffy slope. If you've got to go up, go straight up. Don't go across. Uh, ski patrol, we would do something called ski cutting, where we would get on some really steep stuff like, like the side of that rock. Um, and we get up on top and we jump up and down on our skis to try and create enough vibration in the pack to get it to spontaneously release so it doesn't land on people below. Yeah. And so we'd find these areas and have to deal with them that way. So that's what happens up there. Just your presence or just your movement. And if you've got a bunch of people together, you know, like I'm looking at this group over here, spread out. If you guys think that you can do it and go across that slope, 
one at a time. So is that good or bad? No. Well, there's, there's in general, bad. Because it's kind of straight up. However, they probably went down. we haven't begun to talk about yet another thing. See, this is all this sort of stuff that I'll do spontaneously out there. But we can cover it here and have bathrooms nearby, too. So <laughs> that's important. All right, come over here. This is the top of your mountain, OK? So if this is north, this obviously would be east, east, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, just to give you the idea. Where do the storms, uh, where do the maritime storms um, come from that hit the Sierra? West. West. Where do the winds of that storm come from? Uh, South. Southwest. Perfect. So, top of the mountain. The wind is going to be coming at this angle. Right. More or less, depending right. upon where the storm is. But if this is you, here, the wind's going to come out of the southwest. Right. In general, if the storm is coming right, well, more or less right at you. Especially at the, at the beginning of the storm. If the storm is here, the low is here, it's cycling out of the southwest. If it's on top of you, it may be none, it may be all over the place. It may be calm, whatever. So what I'm getting at is the wind drives the snow, right? The snow is falling, but it's blowing. So you'll get horizontal snow just like you get horizontal rain. Where does it go? You think, oh, it's going to stick on the southwest side of the mountain. No, there's wind transport. Where is it going to go? It's going to go the northeast. over here. So your dangerous aspects or the dangerous side of the hill isn't the side that the snow was dumped on. It's the side where the snow was blown to. And what's it going to do? It's going to pillow, what we call pillowing. It's just going to pile up and pile up and pile up and become more and more unstable because it's too heavy. Which way does this slope face? East. Think about think about where the sun rose. Think about where the sun may be at midday. It's, it's, and what does that tell you about direction? Just another thing to put in your head. Right. So where did the sun rise? Right there. Right over there. Because see, it That's arcs. It's it's it goes arc. southeast. Yeah. So it's what time? It goes east. Of it's 10 10. Us. So in general, these are just rules of thumb. In general, Palm, a palm's width, arm's length, is an hour of sun transport, some sun movement. So one, two, over along the arc of the sun, maybe noon. It's 10 o'clock yeah. now, so two palms over. This is generalized stuff. Right. I'm sure if somebody researched it, they're going to say, Ned, you're all off your rocker. But in general, because this is the stuff that you want to have going through your head, like, right. you know, but what is south, when the sun is in the south, how do, how do I know how to answer Ned's question? What, what direction is this facing? At noon, when you put your sun, you put the sun at your back, which way is your shadow going? The sun is in the south, shadow's in the north. Okay, so that's going to be swinging around, it's going to come through here, that slope right there is facing south. So this general, this little bowl here, is facing south. So what the big do? Well, why, why are we talking about this? What does this have to do with uh, of avalanches? What did we learn? South facing slopes, this guy, is not going to have as much snow as north facing slopes because of wind transport. Yeah. In the Sierra, at this latitude, and where how storms come in. It's going to be more stable because it has less snow. Oh, gee, guess what? It also gets a lot more sun. What does sun do? No. Eats up the snowpack, consolidates it, settles it. It refreezes every night. Now, today, it may only get up to 28 degrees or 35 degrees or something. So maybe, yeah, it could freeze during the day also. But southern-facing slopes or southern aspects of that hill or of yeah, that ridge are more stable. So that'll tell you, hey, do I want to go on to this little ridge right here? Because that's facing north and it's in the shade. This gets sun, consolidates because of it. That's in shade, holds powder longer. So where do I want to pick a route? Out in the sun. Is that also where you would camp? Uh, 
I would, well, I would camp anywhere. One nice thing about snow is you can camp anywhere, but when it comes to avalanches, uh, during the winter, which is when they mostly happen, I will pick a, a flat spot uh, within trees. Uh, you want to look, to, oh boy, there's, that's a whole other subject. The mountains will tell you where avalanches have happened before. So when you're cruising through the Sierra and you have these massive glaciated valleys, right? With trees in the valley and sometimes trees going up the sidewalls, right? And you're looking at that going like, I mean, in the summer it doesn't make any difference, whatever. You'll see places where there are no trees. So you've got this ridge line and you're down in the valley, right? And it's going like that up the, the trees going up the hill. And you'll see, you'll see trees all over the place and here. And then of course it gets too steep and too high and they're not there. And then you have some trees over here. And if you're smart, you'll see why I'm drawing this pattern. <laughs> kind of blew it a little bit. What I'm getting at is if an avalanche starts up here, it starts in a small spot right. and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes down. Right. And it wipes out all the trees, especially if it happens frequently. So you're going to look for this and say, I'm not camping there. Right. So the mountains, if you look up and you pay attention and you have a little bit of thinking other than talking about the next hamburger you're going to get and where your trail, next trail town is and all that, if you're traveling in, in unstable conditions, whether unstable up here or unstable down here, this is the stuff you need to be thinking about. You know, do I want to be traveling for example, the creek will be here, right? This is the hillside, right. that's the ridge. Creek is here and it goes back up over here, right? So I can have avalanches from either side. Right. Which side, if this, is, uh, if this is facing south, which way is this hill facing? North. North. Which side is going to be more unstable? The uh, north side. North side. Mm -hmm. So you can see more avalanche sign over right. here than over here. But what will you see? When an avalanche comes down here, wipes out all the trees, it's gonna go up over here. Right. So where do you wanna camp? Halfway up beside the ridge. Somewhere above, up in the trees. Right. Just stay in the trees. Now, if an avalanche path is here, but not next to it, I'm okay down here. Because right. I'm below the trees, avalanches usually happen over there. A lot of avalanches will start high and come down and take you out down here. These are what's, what's called deposition zones, and you can get 20 feet of snow pile up down here. So if you think, okay, I'll just dig my way out, forget it. Also, if you think you're gonna swim through an avalanche, forget it. It'll, it'll toss you like a wave in the ocean. So if you've ever done any body surfing, it's the same sensation.